today. I will succeed in talking to you about this today. What I'm going to talk to you about this today is this. So I thought this would be interesting. You probably heard about the WMAS anomaly, and that's basically an anomaly which uh, is pretty perfect for interpreting an effective field theory approaches, and it really basically makes clear how having the effective field theory technology around makes interpreting such an anomaly very efficient, and like very quickly people are writing papers on this sort of thing. So I want to talk a little bit about that, and also how using effective field theory thinking lets you ask questions in kind of a, a a, a efficient manner related to such an anomaly so that you can really interpret the experimental measurements uh, they start to give you from the standard model in, in a clean fashion. I'm going to talk to you about this width calculation for the Higgs. Uh, it's kind of an interesting calculation to go through because it kind of orients you towards how the complexity of the theory, even at the minus six, is pretty significant because there's a lot of operators that appear and you have to organize your calculation some way. Uh, and it took us uh, just a couple of years ago was when we first did that calculation just for dimension six interfering with the standard model. Though. So the total Higgs width was not known in this map in its dimension six corrections uh, until a couple of years ago. And that's kind of remarkable, right? You would think all of this stuff would have been tracked and been done. But the reason is that essentially it's a little bit complicated. And then how to efficiently get through that calculation and actually get numbers orients you to thinking in a certain way, which is also consistent with the whole geometric approach, which is part of our, why we started thinking about geometry going through that calculation. So I want to illustrate you there, because you'll see kinematics times the geometry, and kinematics times operator coefficients is what shows up organizing that calculation. And now we think of it as kinematics times geometry when we start to think about these calculations. So geometry is, is a function of those coefficients. And I want to talk then a little bit about the Harvey problem related to your question, both those questions about matching. Kind of the three asking questions. Uh, and then I'm going to use that just to talk about how we think of it in, in these EFT approaches and also how it motivates you to think about well, well, how big will these Wilson coefficients be? So, how big are they, how precise do the experimental measurements have to be for us to really start to profit from these techniques? I mean, in some sense, if this anomaly is really an anomaly from the standard model, we're already in business. So, you kind of have the idea that we're, we're basically near that threshold of precision so that we can actually get a lot out of these techniques. but I'll just give you an example of how to think about this to try and motivate you to see why these techniques are kind of important right now and into the future because of the precision of the experimental program. So that's the plan. Okay, so let's talk about this kind of fascinating anomaly that appeared. So it's something some of us were anticipating for a long time and hoping for for a long time. So it's great for this to appear. And let's see as time goes on with other measurements coming along with this firm stuff. But let's try and interpret this in this map. That's just kind of an intellectual exercise about how this technology that I've been talking about can be used to interpret such a deviation without assuming a specific model. So the anomaly is basically that they measure the W mass with the legacy data set of the Tepatron. And it's a, the errors were reduced very significantly compared to previous measurements. And you can kind of see here that the standard model prediction is this gray band with the best loop corrections known today. And you can see the past measurements have this skew in terms of measurements over the years. But this is a very precise measurement. And they were very careful and they thought a lot about their detector and, and like really studying the data set and understanding the detector very well for many, many years after that experimental program ended. And this is like a very important key legacy. Of that start of that experimental program. So if this is true and it's deviating from the standard model, and I have no reason to doubt this, um, we'll see what we can think about it in the We'll see how that actually leads our uh, how we actually think about it in kind of like a, a straightforward way. So any one measurement, I think this is probably clear from the other two lectures. So let me just re-emphasize this point. Any one measurement doesn't really do much for you, right? Because you have to fix input somehow. So you're gonna have some free parameters in your in your model, whether it's a standard model or some more complicated model. But even the standard model, you don't know the gauge couplings until you measure something and then fix those numerical values. So any one measurement doesn't really mean much in terms of, of deviating uh, from the standard model expectation because you haven't formed your standard model expectation until you've actually measured a set of things, use those set of input measurements to fix some Lagrangian parameters and use those Lagrangian parameters with perturbation theory to then make very precise predictions for other things, which you then measure and then check to see if the standard model expectation works out. Okay, so it's the pattern. It's always the pattern of measurements that can show a theory is breaking down like the standard model describing the data. Okay, so we have to be careful in this map from using all these local contact operators, as I tried to emphasize a number of times, to be very consistent in how the operators can appear affecting the input measurements. That then are involved with how we fix numerical values of things, and also how they exactly appear in the output of some particular measurements. Right? So both of those things need to be taken into account consistently. 
and we saw that a little bit in electric precision data. And you can do that sort of mapping of inputs, outputs, and lots of information. You can use the stair model of Grunge and just see if the stair model work. And that's essentially what's going on here. It's just using the stair model of Grunge with loop corrections, and it doesn't seem to be working so well. So once that happens, you want to basically try and interpret session. This is not working so well in terms of some more uh, different hypothesis. Your hypothesis could be that you jump to a specific model, and then the model parameters could be used if you're careful to do this sort of thing and cause this deviation. But you can also just interpret it generally in this map, and that's what I'm going to talk about. So then you can basically interpret these deviations of this map, map it to a combination of Wilson coefficients, and then later on, once more and more things start to deviate, maybe we can start to put it into the model sort of thinking. Okay, so the thing that's really nice about this map, which I hope is clear, is that it allows the experimental pattern to be different from the standard model while still having a well-defined quantum field theory that we can calculate systematically. So we have the operators, we have the vertices, the vertices under control, we do loop corrections, we can do subleading order corrections, we can think about errors in terms of our interpretation of experimental measurements in the EAT as well as the standard model. This is a well-defined quantum field theory, which is great. So the stuff game plan has always been for many years that we basically are going to find deviations, hopefully like this. We're going to have all this technology developed to map these deviations to very precise formulas in this map, which will be ready to go. And then we'll take those and we'll basically follow the pattern. We won't make mistakes. And we'll be able to follow some underlying model more efficiently as time goes on. That's the idea of all this work. So for the W mass shift, uh, when you talk about a W mass shift, you have to basically choose some input parameter scheme. You always have to choose inputs and outputs. So if you choose the, the, the scheme where you're not actually using the W mass as an input, then essentially you basically get a shift in terms of the predicted mass. So I, I, one of these guys is my friend, Ben Grinstein, so he's, I always want to emphasize that when people were doing S and T in the early 90s, some people were very far ahead of the game and started to do operator interpretations a little bit in this direction, like proto smith analyses. And these gentlemen were doing exactly that. And this is a formula essentially that people are now using to interpret this sort of measurement that goes all the way back there. And the modern results, if you're using alpha input parameter scheme, which is given here, this is from a paper we wrote, but also a lot of people wrote these papers. You basically predict the W mass. This is why there's a hat that has to do with the predictions. So you predict it from some other input measurements. And then basically the deviations in terms of the local contact operators compared to the W mass numerical value. Is just given by this combination of bubbles and coefficients. So this subsumed into this little coefficient of 1 over lambda squared. And this delta here is just this deviation. There's a b squared essentially that comes out of here. So this is b squared over lambda squared times the set of Wilson coefficients. So if that deviation is true, and you're using an alpha input parameter scheme, what it means is one or a combination of these Wilson coefficients has to take on a non-zero numerical value, which is shifting your expectation compared to this kind of model. It's just that simple. And you can start to think about models that give this or give that or some combination thereof, but it's efficiently just organizing your thinking in terms of what can possibly be happening. So that's pretty straightforward, I hope. And if you look back, remember this slide, uh, it becomes a bit uh, subtle perhaps, but hopefully it's clear now because of the discussions we had the last couple of hours about how to interpret things like a W match shift, right? So when I said what I said before was when we use this alpha input parameter scheme, then essentially you use this to define predictions of things, and then you have a deviation for the W mass. This is the formula I showed you before, just working in a slightly different way, and it just appears here. So that's kind of a simple way to interpret things. But you could also choose to use the W mass itself as an input, right? Instead of using it as a prediction of an F wave, you use it as an input. And then, if that's the case, then any new physics specs are going to be defined into the value that you're using. You use that numerically to predict other things, and then those other things would deviate from the standard model pattern, right? So that obviously you do either one, and it's a choice which one you do. So this can be a bit conceptually confusing, right? Because why why is this happening, right? This choice seems to be like, well, wait a minute, UV physics should just be something that doesn't care about the choices we make. But what's actually happening here is that this UV physics is being absorbed into the input parameters. And when I talked to you about the decoupling theorem a while ago, I hope, hopefully you got the point that I emphasized. In that theorem, they explicitly were saying that you, know, you absorb a bunch of physics effects, new physics effects, heavy physics effects into input parameters, into parameters in the Lagrangian, and the remaining deviations are the local contact operators which have a specific form. So this is completely consistent 
with the decoupling theorem. There's nothing really mysterious here, but sometimes people get a little confused because you make this choice to that choice. And it might seem like we're going to interpret the physics measurements in some way that really depends on our choices. But what happens is if we measure enough things globally, eventually the choice we make here damps out. We just need to measure enough things to nail down the individualized and the Wilson coefficients. And then it basically is independent, more and more independent of the input parameter scheme choice we make, what we do in terms of our interpretation. So that's another reason why, beyond the other reasons I was saying before about field redefinitions moving things around, that we need to do a global program in this map. It's not just a one measurement thing. It's always been the pattern of measurements is what basically informs us about a theory breaking down and mapping to a new theory. Uh, but we really need a large set of experimental results combined consistently, very important, in the global set. And then the input parameter dependence will damp out. And just in general, then we'll get solid conclusions. So if we want to do best practices of inputs to then have the inputs define numerical values of the Lagrangian parameters to then predict a whole bunch of other things, which we then combine into a global SMAP fit program, and we basically learn about physics beyond the standard model in the coming decades, what do we need for good inputs? So good input observables, things fixing the numerical values of the Lagrangian parameters have a couple of characteristics one should keep in mind, right? So first of all, you want them to be precise. We want them to be something that we actually can measure rather precisely so we can make good, solid predictions of other things. We want them to be theoretically well defined, by which I mean not IR sensitive. Right? If you have large loop corrections or if it's very sensitive to soft emissions of, of gauge fields, photons and that sort of thing, that can make it so that it's very difficult to basically get precise numerical values mapped into other areas. This is kind of redundant, but that's kind of the same point. There's another problem in this map. Okay, which is what I want to emphasize with respect to the W mass input. So another problem is that if, you, if you're basically going to assign these input values, input parameters, to fix numeric values and things in the Samuel Lagrangian, and if you analyze the data under the Samuel assumption, you have some Monte Carlo program that basically is doing some predictions that basically lets you understand a very precise input measurement, then that can be fine. But then you can ask yourself the question, I want to basically have this shift in the W mass or some other input be, a, be something that we're using for, to basically be interpreted in this math. But if you, if you want to do that in some measurement, you have to make sure that that measurement itself, how they do the measurement experimentally, doesn't have intrinsic standard model assumptions so that when they basically want to interpret it with a shift, that that, that breaks down. So basically it has to be interpretable in the EFT itself. There has, doesn't have to be like other problems that come in. So the other standard model EFT problems can't come in to basically break these sorts of principles, which makes it a good input observable. So you have to be careful about that. But because we have this technology on our hands in terms of the standard model of Lagrangian, we can actually answer that. Like it's formulated, the theory's there. We can calculate, check these things, compare to the standard model interpretation and see what actually breaks down if anything does. And that also leads to another thing. So sometimes with input observables, you don't use one measurement, but you use a bunch of different measurements which you combine from different experiments. And then the combination defines a numeric value of the Lagrangian parameter. And that can be fine if it's a standard model and it have all the errors and all the correlation coefficients and everything for the standard model combination. That they're very careful about that. That can be fine, but that's something else that can change if you have this math because it can change basically individual measurements of the same parameter of the standard model can have other operator forms of another measurement. So that can actually be something that goes wrong as you start to interpret things in this math. So I just want to illustrate this point, talking about the W mass a little bit. Okay. So the W mass, the one that they're doing at the tetratron, is basically that what they're doing is they're fitting a kinematic shape. Okay, so what is happening there is that there is some missing energy. They're using transverse variables because of the, the W is decaying and missing energy in the final state. They have a transverse mass, and essentially they're looking for this kinematic edge that appears right around the W mass in the transverse mass plane. But they're doing this with experimental detector detectors that are real-world detectors that smear out things and that cause this kinematic structure to be smeared into this sort of form. This is just us doing this sort of thing externally in terms of our smearing effects. But the experimentalists took 10 years basically to get that more updated measurement because they understand really well how their detector is basically doing that smearing effect. So what essentially is happening is this formula is basically the relevant formula. There's this value of the transverse mass and basically they're measuring things that function best. Or form this function mass, but the transverse mass factor is being reconstructed. And this gives a kinematic structure, which looks like this before smearing, which gets smeared out into like the overall shape here. This shape knows about exactly that structure. So what they do is they build a whole bunch of templates, which basically have that shape slightly changed as a function of the W mass. 
and they basically fit the data. They basically bin the data and they look what is which template fits the data. That's what's actually going on. And what's feeding in here is lots of different complications and such, but one thing that feeds in is, of course, the PDFs for the initial state. Right? So you have to understand those PDFs well, and that's why the LHC measurements, which are going to be upcoming, are a little bit different, but people are careful in terms of cross comparing systems in terms of this kind of model. So, what you could worry about in terms of the SMAP, consistent with what I said before, is what can go wrong when all those local contact operators are around. Okay? Does this whole story hold up? Does the formula change in a way that screws up our interpretation? So, what we're going to particularly worry about is how the W coupling normalization and weight shifts change things as well as the mass. Because the mass is here, it's dictating this shape with that formula I showed you before, but that coupling from that vertex could differ. And that could just be in the smack with the local contact operator in the case. The width that's here as well can differ. And if those things are different than the standard model, then you have to be careful mapping the deviation just onto the mass shape. So that's really nice about the EFT is you can actually formulate these questions in a well-defined way and basically check to see if these, if these inference issues are actually a big problem. So the way you can check this is you can basically look at basically the normalization of this formula, and you can basically uh, you can basically look at how the specter is normalized and then compare that normalization effect, which they float and fit to the data, uh, to, to basically how the shifts come in in terms of the SMAP, in terms of the residual effects, the extra effects that can be run compared to the standard model. Okay, so this normalization, so what you would worry about, let me be a little more careful about this, what you would be worried about for this sort of coupling effect, for example, would be that it gives an overall normalization effect up or down. Right, you want to get rid of that. And then they float the normalization in their experimental measurement. So you can take that normalization shift using the fact that the normalization has to do with the shift in these couplings or possible map shifts or width shifts. And we know the Wilson coefficient depends on each of those sorts of shifts. We can basically take the fact that they float the normalization, translate it into Wilson coefficient directions, which they're basically insensitive to, and see if the remaining Wilson coefficient directions correspond to the mass shift. Okay. So that's basically what you do. You decompose the width into one that they float and one that is not floated. And the normalization you decompose in the same way. And we know those decomposition formulas because we know the Wilson coefficient dependence of all these things. They're all calculable things in the EFT because we know the Wilson coefficients, how they affect each of these things. And then you basically decompose the normalization into this width shift and this width shift. And this is all just calculable. Basically, the things in the EFT are calculable is the point I'm making here. And they can do this sort of analysis. Okay, so what this analysis is showing you, this is from the work I did with the master student a while ago, is if you started to shift the width, how much trouble you would be in interpreting this in terms of just the mass shift. Okay, because this width shift being on the order of like percent is basically what the Wilson coefficient effect should do. So if you do the interpretation of the experimental shift in terms of the W mass and assume the width corrections are all zero, that you, you, you know is a bit strange. But you can say, well, how wrong am I going to be if I basically let those width shifts be around? Okay, so what that's showing you here is that the width changing a little bit would basically cause your interpretation of the W mass to basically go off very badly if you didn't float the normalization of the spectrum. So what's this, this, this decomposition here is basically the one that is parallel, which is one that goes with the normalization of the spectra. If that was floated, if that was deviating from the spectrum, they didn't float the normalization, in other words. Then with inference effects, normalization inference effects would basically cause very small perturbations to cause you to basically interpret the W mass that you got out of the template fit to be off quite a bit from what you expected. So this would be either an extra error that you have to introduce in terms of interpreting the W mass measurement, or you have to interpret it in terms of a two-dimensional space where you have the width shift and the W mass shift around, and you basically project it that way. You do either one. This other direction is the residual, because we're decomposing the width shift into the parallel and purple perpendicular directions. And, and that one is described well by the current statistical errors. This was from the analysis a couple of years ago, but the story basically has remained unchanged in terms of how it works, right? Um, and this statistical error was big enough to incorporate this effect, which is still around in terms of interpreting the data. That's not how they define the error, it just happens to be that it's small enough that it's not an extra problem. So what these plots are showing you is that. If they didn't float the normalization, they would be in deep trouble doing a fit and just thinking about it as terms of the shift of the W mass. But they're smart, and they knew that. They were thinking about this in the standard model. They did float the normalization. They got rid of this big problem in terms of the inference of interpreting their measurement and the residual problem that's still around. 
seems to be well described by the errors that they assigned at least a couple of years ago for the W mass measurements. And that goes through in terms of the EOT interpretation as well. So it seems like we can actually think about this input and this shift in terms of that simple mass shift formula I showed you before, at least at tree level. Okay. Hopefully that's clear. Now, the other thing I said you can start to do in the EFT, you can start to think about combinations, right? So this is one measurement, this one here. So which one should you use if you want to make predictions? You want to use that as an input. Should you use this? Should you use this combined with some other? Should you use the full global combination? Right? If you're going to use it as an input value, these are choices you can make in terms of numerically what you're going to use it for and how you're going to use it. So if you're just doing the standard model, again, you, you're fine to combine under the assumption of a standard model like assumption with the standard model errors and correlations that people have figured out. They don't, they have not yet produced a global combination, including this, but the old numbers that they have for global combinations, they basically put things together you can just use. You can try to do something a little bit straightforward. But you have an extra problem on your hands in terms of the standard model EFT, because not all of these measurements are made in the same way, other like different sorts of content pathway effects are around. So you have to be worried about how that interferes with your inference in terms of um, the W mass you want to do a combination. So what I mean by that is essentially this transverse variable story, it corresponds to this set of measurements and this set of measurements. So they, you might think you can combine under the assumption of being careful, like I was just discussing on the bit shifts. But there's another set of measurements here, these ones. And what they did was essentially they inferred the W mass and constraints on the W mass from diagrams like this. This is at left two. So they did a threshold scan at left two, where they're producing two W's neuron shell, and then they were just putting a little bit about those energies in the left two program at the left one. And neuron shell is basically a nice kinematic behavior of this, of this, of, of this cross-section growing, essentially, that lets you infer a W mass shift. But if you go further and further off shell, further further off the, the, the threshold production of the W pair, then you basically have more and more um, effects of both of these diagrams appearing, and you're basically starting to have a, uh, an interpretation of those sorts of measurements in terms of W mass shift, which we really have to think of like two to four scattering. Now, in both cases, it's calculable where the Wilson coefficients appear and perturb the sorts of deviations, right? You can just calculate this thing, you can just figure out how these deviations come into the EFT, that's one of the benefits of the EFT. And essentially what it tells you is that you should probably should not use the left two measurements to combine it naively, mostly because there's sort of EFT effects here on this vertex that can be around to kind of cause an inference problem. So, I mean, it depends on whether they're threshold dominated or not. I would not use any of the left two measurements. These ones are particularly, these ones are near threshold, they, have, they can kind of be combined in. These ones are particularly problematic because they are more away from threshold. And so there's basically more problems in terms of combining them and interpretation. But these are the sorts of things you can do as guiding your opinion as to how if you want to do a spence interpretation, you actually combine the data to get a, a global combination that you would use for input. Okay. So that's the sort of thing you can do when you have an input. Uh, you can check to see that you're not under-interpreting or over-interpreting it and that you're carefully thinking about what the measurement actually means in terms of the spent. And going forward as more and more anomalies hopefully appear, this is the sort of thing you can do, which is basically be very careful interpreting the data step by step. Are there any questions on that? I'm going to go now talk about the Higgs width calculation quite a bit. Are there, are there any questions? Okay, if you think of a question as I go forward, don't worry about stopping. Let's talk a little bit about something different now, which is calculating the Higgs width in the standard model EFT system, then, at least up to, to dimension six. So when you want to study the properties of the standard model Higgs, it's more complicated than the left example I talked about the other day, right? The left example was E plus and minus, there was one intermediate resonance and then some set of decays, it was just pretty straightforward. And now we have a whole bunch of different production mechanisms, we have a whole bunch of different decay channels, and we're essentially doing global combinations in, in the Higgs program, which we're combining in with left, but we have to take into account a whole bunch of different production and decays. And again, we have to take into account all the higher dimensional operator effects in both cases when we're doing that sort of thing. So these are just some a little bit legacy measurements in terms of what they do. What they actually do is they basically uh, they basically do a global fit in these SDXS spins, where they basically use glue on glue fusion as a normalization and they measure cross sections compared to glue on fusion. And they measure a particular clean decay width. Is easy the four left on the day, and they use they basically do branching ratios 
Ratios of branching ratios in terms of how they interpret the experimental data. So they basically take their global data set and break it up into a global fit. What they do, they normalize by two things that are very precisely known in the standard model. So that's fine. If you want to start going in the direction of full standard model 18 interpretations of this, what you need to do is you basically need to have all of these higher dimensional operators which are appearing in the production panel and in the K channels all be included. And in particular, we're going to talk about the Higgs width and how that comes in and how that basically is a characteristic way that all these are kind of come in in a particular set of the Higgs. Okay. So what they do in their sort of modeling is they basically take a whole bunch of signals and, and basically they're combining, breaking out the way I just told you the previous slide, and they're basically inferring the cross-section times the branching ratio, and then they, they're doing the fit I was just telling you about. But there's, a, there's something that happens here which is basically they worry about the number of events that pass their experimental cuts, right? And those, those number of events that pass their experimental cuts before they do that sort of mapping can change if we have different phase space populations in the standard model EFT compared to the standard model. So you have to worry about how big those effects are. Those are kinematic effects, and you basically have to figure out how much that affects your interpretation of the data. So that's not organized we're thinking going forward. We're going to be thinking about kinematics times the effects, looking for anomalous kinematics, and looking at kinematics times Wilson coefficients in terms of how we interpret the Higgs width. Okay. So the Higgs width, you probably know in the standard model, it's very small. Right? And it actually is kind of remarkable that we can actually see most of these decay channels in the case of the standard model. And it's four MeV. So we're going to perturb it with a whole bunch of effects. Some of which can be modifying case decay to two fermions like BV, the two photon decay. This one, which is loop level in the standard model, is E photon, the blue blue case decay, the blue blue decay, sorry, and then the four fermion decay, which also can happen through ZZ and WW. Okay? All of those things can shift due to the higher dimensional operators. And if you want to have a very small width measurement with all these perturbations added up, you need to include all of that. But we can do that at least at leading order, and it's done now in this map. We can even do it at loop now. Okay. Unless I've done that. Okay, so if we're talking about branching ratios. Remember, branching ratios are the total width compared to some particular decay channel. So a shift in a branching ratio will go from a shift, you know, it'll be a combination of the Higgs width and also the individual channel decay. Okay, so we also want to know for that reason too if we're going to interpret it at that level. So let's start with the simplest one in terms of how higher dimensional operators appear. You have this sort of Yukawa interaction. Things like H to BV, and how does that change in the case of the standard model EFT? Again, you always have to map things to input observables, so you have to somehow map your standard model expectation to input observables, and you map it in this way to the VEV, and essentially that's inferred. That's the normalization that comes here. Remember, there's one VEV scale that comes in here, it's measured from inputs. And so that's why we pop out this delta GF for a SMEF correction factor for this decay, because the VEV, when you inferred it, has a slight change to the higher dimensional operators. And you also have to have a canonically normalized theory. So you have the kinetic term of the Higgs, you canonically normalize it, and you have some higher dimensional operators changing that canonical normalization. This combination here. Now, this combination is exactly something that comes out of the geometry, actually. So we'll get back to that later. But this combination is here. And then you can also have just a direct operator that changes this vertex. So that's pretty straightforward. You just add those things up, and you have the total shift in, in the K of Higgs to two fermions. And for Higgs to BB, that kind of matters for the experimental result. But again, hopefully that's clear. The input observable shift is also being included, and also the canonical normalization. So for fo two photon decay, it's pretty straightforward in the standard model. It's just a one loop process in the standard model. It's these diagrams. And you basically probably know these formulas where you have the intermediate states, which are basically the top part, and then you have the W. And essentially, you need to do the interference of that at tree level. With these higher dimensional operators. So if you just look at the interference of this, you basically have again input parameter shifts that come in. This is when you're not using the W mass as an input. You have W mass appearing through these intermediate diagrams. So you can have that shift. And then you have basically the tree level diagrams that you could write down, causing this tree level decay, takes to gamma gamma, which is just combined up here into this combination. And these three things added up are just the width of the standard model. Uh, with the Higgs decaying two photons at tree level being changed. Okay, we actually know this calculation to much higher orders. I'm going to get to that tomorrow. But this is like the leading thing you would calculate. Another straightforward result. So far, nothing really unusual has happened because so far it's been three point functions essentially. So the kinematics is just like the standard model kinematics. And it's going to get more interesting. 
because you have individual off-shell Ws here, and you have four Fermi on decay. And so you have to worry about how that phase space population changes when you have the higher dimensional operators in the case of the SMAC compared to the standard model. So the standard model decay, you basically go through this vertex, quite straightforward. You again have the product to normalize the Higgs, which is again quite straightforward, goes with the same kinematics as the standard model. You have this operator now that can just sit here. Okay, this operator can sit here, and you'll notice it has a field strike here. So that's a modified momentum flow compared to the standard model. So what that means is the kinematics of this is a bit different. The final phase space population of those four fermions will be, a, will be slightly different compared to the standard model expectation. And if you do experimental cuts under the standard model assumption, you have to basically worry about that in terms of how you're interpreting that data. There's also the fact that you can have snap perturbations in the propagator, and those can also change the momentum flow because they basically cause the width to be shifted or the mass to be shifted. Mass be shifted, and you have to basically linearly expand these out. And then you get these momentum factors like this that appear if you're not using the W mass as an input. All of these things are calculable, and when there's anomalous kinematics, you can just do the phase space integrals and just see the numbers to see how different it is compared to the standard model phase space. There's also this effect, which is basically you can not have this in the standard model, but when you have a higher dimensional operator, you can have a direct coupling of the Higgs to two fermions with a gauge field, this didn't mean here on shell. And then decays. So again, that's a four form of decay. And that comes from operator forms like this that are in the Warsaw basis. And essentially, if you look at this compared to the other diagrams, you were missing a propagator. So when you're doing these phase space integrals to define the four fermion decay, you basically are removing a propagator from the standard model uh, amplitude when you're integrating over phase space, which is this here. Okay, so all these you just integrate over four body phase space. It's pretty straightforward, just technically a little bit complicated to get the phase space integrals to converge numerically. So, how different are these sorts of phase space effects, which we can take into account systematically in the EFT? So, if you just basically break this down into kinematics times rescaling, kinematics times something which we're going to start to interpret as geometry. In the standard model, the standard model kinematics is just this number. You get these momentum factor. You do these integrations over the propagators, you just get this number. Not a very interesting number, but that's what you get. And if you start to look at these different effects about essentially the changing of the propagator, this is the one that has to do with the vertex being different, the momentum flow being different. This is when you're removing the propagator, the other guy. And you integrate these phase space integrals. What you find is these kinematic numbers change compared to the standard model by you know, pretty significant amounts of times. We want to take it into account, but it's systematically calculable. We can take it into account in EDFT. So, this will be differences in the phase space population. So, when they do cuts, this can affect their interpretation. Okay. It gets a little more complicated for the Zs. I mean, it's the same basic idea, but when you have the Zs, remember you have both Zs and photons that can be there in the intermediate state. So, that gets a bit nastier. But just with the Zs, there's another problem too with the indistinguishability. In terms of the final states, that you can basically exchange these guys. So you have two kinematic numbers in the case of the ZDK. One where you just have this, one where you have the cross one. So there's these two numbers to compare against in the case of just the standard model kinematic numbers. You do the same story of putting all the higher dimensional operators and look about how the phase space can change in that case. And you get these sets of numbers and you can compare yourself to see just like 40, 50% effects here in terms of the kinematic populations. So you want to correct for that when you interpret the data. And again, you'll notice this calculation is all being organized in terms of kinematics times the physics effects. That's the way to think. So another thing that's a bit interesting is how much the narrow width approximation breaks down because of the higher dimensional operators. And what I mean by that is that essentially you can interfere with these sorts of diagrams. And if you have this gamma gamma, piece of gamma gamma intermediate state in the case of the standard model, that's loop suppressed. So the breakdown of the narrow width approximation is suppressed by that loop factor. But now this is a tree level operator in the case of the EFT, so you have to worry about this interfering with things like that in the standard model when it's easy. So that can lead to bigger differences in terms of how you're thinking about the narrow width approximation factorizing the diagram up into pieces, and you have to take that into account. The same thing can also happen with blue blue for intermediate states for the final state quarks. And you have to take into account all of those interference effects consistently. Because these guys are no longer loop suppressed, in the standard model, if these were not loop suppressed effects, 
then the, then the narrow width approximation used in that calculation in the standard model for Higgs decay would be really off. It's actually quite accurate to use the narrow width approximation. But because these guys are now uh, no longer loop level, the shift in the standard model expectation due to the deviations between the higher dimensional operators, the narrow width approximation doesn't give you a good prediction of that. But we can take, take that into account. So basically, this does in fact arise nicely in this manner with the corrections to the standard model, whereas it still works in the standard model rather well. Hopefully that's clear. And then you also have to worry about other things, which are so these are also present in the standard model, but small. So you have basically neutral and charge current interferences that happens so if these diagrams can cross interfere with one another. So it's just like all the inference facts you have to take into account. Many of them are suppressed because of the loop processes in the standard model, which are no longer suppressed. It's basically that idea. So then you have to take that into account consistently. Now, you might say to yourself, oh, I don't care. These operators that you're saying are like tree level effects, which in the standard model are loop level. You might think of some UV scenario where those matching coefficients for those operators are also loop level. And then the narrow width approximation will work better and all those sort of subtleties I was talking about would be damped by the fact that the Wilson coefficients that are causing issues are themselves numerically small in a particular matching for a particular UV model. There's cases that are like that. And you can think about those cases if you wish. The power of the EFT is you don't have to just constrain yourself to thinking of those cases. You can think of the more general behavior of the Wilson coefficient changing its effects, do the calculation all at once, and then at the end of the day, once you know your model, pump in your Wilson coefficient numerical values from some matching, and then you can still use the same calculational result. So what you might want to realize, though, is that this is actually the way you should think about the operator. So let's just think about Higgs to gamma gamma, okay? So Higgs to gamma gamma, you can get Wilson coefficients from diagrams like this, like the case of the top part in the standard model, you could have some heavy fermion field, which basically gives you that sort of matching coefficient that could be loop suppressed if it's perturbative. And that's fine, and that's calculable in the EFT if you did the matching coefficient. But you can also have things which are just like the operator appearing itself there, right? It can just be there, and you have because it's like a non perturbative physics effect, you have a whole bunch of states running in this loop, and you basically can't resolve it. And that can also be something that you can think about. And the great part about EFT is just by keeping the Wilson coefficient dependence as a numerical dependence on a coefficient, you capture that possible physics effect. You don't have to solve strong physics to do that. You just basically treat it as a parameter you fit from the data. And it's also kind of interesting to note that some of these effects you can really think about as essentially resolving substructure of the Higgs, right? The Higgs itself might not be a point particle. It might be something that's composite, which has a pumped wavelength. And you can think of some of these effects involving particularly Higgs to gamma gamma, these loop suppressed effects, as essentially resolving the substructure of the Higgs and that's something that you can also capture in the EFT by just writing down the operator. All that stuff can be captured if you just keep the general case and just do the calculation the way I motivate in trying to tell you to do it, you capture all this stuff. So you don't, you don't exclude these sort of possibilities from your thinking. And we can't really calculate these things because they're really kind of non-perturbative. So it's kind of good to do the general bottom of EFT where we avoid this calculational problem in the UV. So what you get is not very interesting, but that's just to show you there are plots with numbers you can look at the paper for the detail. At the end of the day, you look at the Wilson coefficient dependence that comes in for the Higgs decaying to all of these four fermions and is calculable. The numbers are known. People can cross-check. We can use those results straightforward. In both input parameter schemes, we can do this. So it's kind of both input parameter schemes. And then you get formulas like this, which previously we didn't know until a couple of years ago, but we can have a systematically calculate. So let's look at this formula just to kind of think about it a little bit. So this is two different input parameter schemes. Are they the same formula? No, well, there's a lot of similarities, but some things change. And those are the those Wilson coefficient dependencies that change are exactly the ones that have to do with input parameter dependency. Okay, so if you look here, this is like 0 0.50, 0 0.40, but then there's this. 1.2 and basically 2.9. There's some big effects like this, which you might not naively pick up. That effect is the Higgs blue blue operator. That's all basically coming about from two things. One is the Higgs to blue decay, and then the dependence of that operator that basically goes through the four fermion decays. Both of those things are combined up, and that's a really big effect actually. Things that are modifying Higgs to BB are actually pretty big, you can see here. You can see here. But you can just calculate this and check all the coefficients and just systematically improve this formula as you wish. So we can take into account this sort of information. Okay, so these are the calculable formulas. And then if you knew these most coefficient values, you would know the size of the width shift. 
So as I was trying to emphasize as I was discussing this, and as I'm trying to always do the, these lectures, point you in the direction of, because of where we're going to get at the end of the week to the geometry discussion, the efficient way we calculate is we've organized our thinking in terms of kinematics, time scaling factors. We've looked at the different sets of kinematics, did the phase space stuff separately, did it all at once, and then basically figured out what was the coefficient in front, combination of those coefficients in front of each case. So doing this calculation is essentially right around the time we start doing the geometry stuff, and there's a reason that we start doing the geometry thinking this way as well, because it is actually very efficiently organized calculation. Now, if you think about it, when you're doing that sort of thing, if you have kinematics, like I showed you some examples of kinematics, which are like the standard model kinematics, like the Higgs uh, canonical normalization effect, right? That, that canonical normalization of the standard model Higgs that was appearing in the combination of operators, the kinetic term correction that have the same kinematics as the standard model. Well, if you think about that, this numerical fact, this numerical factor that you calculate, the perturbative, the kinematics that you're actually doing the phase space integrals on, if you have a dimension eight contribution, which is just like that, like the dimension six, it will also have the same kinematics. It'll just be further suppressed by, in some cases, B squared over lambda squared. It will have the same kinematics when you do the phase space integrals. So when you've done these phase-based integrals for some of the dimension six interference effects, you also know some information you can use in dimension eight. And it'll just be that those dimension eight effects are further suppressed by an extra power of b squared over lambda squared. So you might want to think, well, what's an efficient way to basically organize one's thinking so that I can efficiently use that sort of information going forward? And that's geometry again. And there's going to be like long time around them. I actually saw some examples of that led to like these 40, 50 percent effects. And at dimension six, you saw some of these things. But that's just another illustration of the different expansion parameters present in this map. Both of those things are around and actually can affect our experimental interpretation quite a bit. And the efficient way to calculate separating out these two things is the geometry approach. If you don't, well, so at just dimension six, we've solved this problem for you. So if you if you use MadGraph with UFO models, you can just take the SMEPSIM result, the SMEPSIM UFO model, and you just plug it in and you just recalculate essentially all that I was just showing you, and you can just do all sorts of simulation effects just for the linear interference of dimension six. It's a solved problem, and you can basically just plug this guy in and, and just show it dimension six, go for it. So let me discuss a little bit about how big these effects should be. We talked about two examples. We talked about this W mass shift, which is just as a function of the Wilson coefficients. I try to convince you we can interpret things Kind of precisely enough that we can actually believe that the shift that we get in terms of the numerical value can be mapped to this formula at tree level. We calculated these two things. You saw how the calculation was done in this case. And they're all functions of some unknown coefficients. So, how big are the overall effects? This, we've just focused on what we can calculate, but then you have to worry about the matching in terms of how big those effects are going to be, right? To overall, to see how big these effects are for experimental interpretations. Now, there's lots of different cases. The glory of the EFT is it captures all those cases all at once, and you don't have to choose to do the calculation. You just do the general calculation and plug it in at the end. But it'd be nice to know, like roughly speaking, how big these effects should be. So one way to motivate how big you think these effects should be is to think about the hierarchy problem in terms of numerical sensitivity that comes into the shift of the, the Higgs mass to the higher dimensional operators. Yeah. Um, what's the advantage of doing these calculations in both in two different input parameter schemes. Do you learn something by looking at the yeah? So essentially, as a mantra, you should always do calculations in more than one input parameter scheme, so you're aware of where the scheme dependence lies. So one reason to do it is just to understand many of these numbers to notice are very similar, but a couple of them differ. So it's just one thing, it's just it's good practice to have both to basically make sure you don't do any sort of interpretation that is intrinsically a parameter scheme dependent. Some of them come along and change to a different parameter scheme and get different UV model physics conclusions. Um, and the other reason to do it is that over time, it can change what you do for your input numbers, right? So it used to be that everyone would use an alpha input parameter scheme, this one. Because at the time of lap one, that was very precise and there was no precise measurement of the W mass of the tetratron, to say nothing of the more recent W mass measurement of the tetratron. So, a lot of calculations are actually, some, a lot of them at high loop order, are actually fixed in terms of like what parameter scheme they use. A lot of the left stuff uh, was done with alpha. And it took time for the theorists to basically come along and basically figure out how to do interpolation formulas to basically take those parameter schemes results and map them to something that you can use for the W mass. 
So as time goes on, it can change what inputs you want to use. So basically, it's good to keep two in principle, and it's also just in practice, our use of them changes over time. So it's just a good practice. I always try and do papers where I do two. Most people do not, but that's kind of where I think we should actually have the standard of two. For the global interpretation LHC program, they're going to use the WMAPS uh, as an input going into their current program, their current global program. Okay, let's talk about the hierarchy problem coming up. Excuse me? Yeah. Are people looking to uh, how do you deal with the uh, relative corrections within the denominator and standard model part? Uh, so they're they're in these numbers. So some dependence here. Uh, so you, which 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 rate of corrections do you mean? Do you mean like soft photon emission or do you mean like the loop diagram no, in the sure. sure. Yeah, so so when I talk about photon, photon, so when you have a standard model process that first appears at one loop, we interfere with that leading part of the standard model. So in the photon, photon case, we take the one loop part of the standard model amplitude and we interfere with the tree level insertion of the higher dimensional operators. We can push those formulas and I'll show them to you tomorrow. We calculated that now to much higher order uh, to be more consistent, but that's currently what these results show. Um, but we have the result now we have the, the current state of the art of the field in terms of blue blue Higgs and Higgs to blue blue decay and Higgs to gamma gamma is to have the interference of the standard model with, with one loop with the dimension six operators. The dimension six operator one loop result interfered with the one loop result of the standard model. You can even have the two loop result of the standard model interfere with the tree level part of the, of the dimension six operators. And then you can also have the dimension eight. <laughs> The, the part of the SMEF and interfere that with the tree level and through the standard model. So we know all those things. This is the calculations just keep moving forward. But this is like the lowest order one that we're trying to do here. Try and talk about the hierarchy problem. Okay, so here's an example. We talked about this for generating the dimension five operators. So I thought it was a nice example to just illustrate things. We just it's all about Taylor expanding at the end of the day, either to find the EFT itself or doing the matching. So in the case of the seesaw model, the Taylor expand this heavy intermediate Majorana mass, and you expand the propagator up, you got this dimension five operator. Right? You saw that. It's pretty straightforward. It's coming from this model. You can also do these one loop contributions. You need this mass shift and to get the shift in the potential. It's fine. I'm a bit pressed for time, so I'm going to go a bit quicker. So what you're doing there, answer to your question at the start, is you're basically taking something where you have the standard model, you have a specific new physics model, in this case the seesaw model, and you're basically doing at tree level the Taylor expansion, and then you're doing one loop calculations in this UV model and Taylor expanding the one loop result as well. And then you start basically making the things match up. That's what matching is. You basically do it on both sides of the equation. And you say this has to equal that. And that's all there is to it. So you get the dimension five operator, and at loop level you get shifts to the potential and the Higgs mass. Okay, it's very straightforward. Now, I've tried to emphasize you always think about symmetries and worrying about things like input parameters. So you might worry that we just violated the decoupling theorem here, right? Because I just got a big effect in this case for the Higgs mass, right? Which is not necessarily an input. This is like going with this heavy mass scale, and it was going with the heavy mass scale in the numerator squared, right? It has a small coupling, but it's going in the numerator. And didn't the decoupling theorem say that that heavy mass scale dependence always had to be in the denominator? Right, so what, what happened there? So what happened there is that if you, again, think carefully about the decoupling theorem, it really is all about the inputs, okay? If you look, apart from coupling constant and field strength normalization, so apart from fixing the input parameters, and that means also fixing the Higgs mass itself as an input, which you could do for a finite normalization of the Higgs mass, uh, then the extra appearance of the heavy mass scale is down below. Okay, but it can appear in the numerator for dimension two operator like the Higgs mass. And when you have a heavy new physics scenario that's coupled to the Higgs and you do these loop diagrams, generically, you do get that heavy mass scale dependence in the numerator, as you would expect by dimensional analysis, times H dagger H. And that's the hierarchy problem, even if you're using dimensional regularization, so you don't worry about cutoffs that you're introducing by hand, it's just the heavy mass scales that you're integrating out. The appearance of that heavy mass scale squared in the numerator is the thing that is concerning because what we actually see is a small value for the Higgs mass, right? 
So in the case of this matching, I just wanted to go through this in a little bit of detail. This is an example for you. So you basically are doing this diagram. It's just a two loop, it's just a one loop diagram. It's very straightforward. Break down the propagator, do your usual shit. All your technology and text can be shorter can be done. And you just get this result, and you just have to do these final parameter integrations. That's all there is to it. You just do this by hand. The slides are there, you can check the results and go through it yourself if you wish. So when you basically renormalize the UV theory, you get rid of the epsilon hole using dim right. And you can also do this nice trick when you do matching, which is essentially that you can expand before integrating. Because on both sides of the equation, you're going to do the expansion. It's actually kind of nice. You can simplify the formula by doing this expansion and then integrate. And then this leading term is kind of simpler. And then if you have a lot of dimensionless integrals, those dimensionless integrals in dim right are kind of simple. So it's just a nice trick that you can do because you're going to tailor expand anyways. You can just do it at the start of the calculation. And then the scale of integrals vanishing when you use dimensionalization matching means a bunch of stuff like this is just zero, which is kind of nice. Good. And then you get this sort of thing, this contribution. And then you get this, which is removed by a wave function normalization. It's P squared. It has to do with uh, you know, derivatives acting on the Higgs field. Wave function normalize that. So I would encourage you to go through this calculation yourself. It's very straightforward. You just start basically back here and you expand out. And you can just look at the individual pieces following along. It's also in the SMEF review and see how this stuff works and how each of these sort of things happen in the Taylor expansion. It's very straightforward, but it's kind of nice to do one example yourself, kind of running out of time. So the problem with the hierarchy problem is not just one particular model. If you had one particular model, you might not care, right? So in one particular model, you can say, well, and I actually do say this in the literature, <laughs> if it's just the neutrino that's there that's heavy, why don't we just think of the Higgs mass that we see as a one loop effect from that heavy mire on a mass. What's wrong with that? Not much. Actually, that's actually what the neutrino option is about. But the problem with the Hartree problem is that that keeps happening. That, you know, if you have other states coupled to the standard model case, and you do that sort of loop calculation, that you keep getting those contributions. And if they're heavier, you get another contribution in the numerator, which has a very heavy mass scale. And if you keep going up in mass scales, this keeps happening with more and more you know, actual states you're integrating it out as you go up all the way to the Planck scale, if you think other physics is around like that, these things keep happening and it happens with scalars and vectors and also fermions. And it kind of characteristically comes in like this where you get contributions with a Higgs mass, which has essentially some 16 pi squared suppression from the loop, some heavy mass scale dependence will come in characteristically in the numerator, and you saw how it came in in the fermion case. The signs will be fixed by Fermier's Fermier Dirac statistics. And then you have the scalar also happening in this case. And then you have these ends, which are just basically the number of internal degrees of freedom that can run around. Just characteristically, that's how the Higgs mass scales. And the problem is that just keeps happening over and over and over again. So even if it happened in one case and you like that, it keeps happening. So you have to basically think that the Higgs mass that we see at low scales is the combination of all that stuff going up higher and higher scales, unless you have a symmetry to control things. And all these things add up to then introduce a mass, which is exactly this bump mass that we see. And that bothers people because that means that physics at different scales would have to cancel a lot, and they want to have a symmetry that basically controls that cancellation. And that's based one of the canonical examples of supersymmetry, but which basically basically makes this sort of cancellation happen. But that's the hard problem in dim ray in these fields. Now I always say it. Think about whether or not there is a symmetry being violated when you're doing a matching or when you're thinking in the EFT. So you might say to yourself, wait, when we had lepton number violation, we were happy with how it came in in terms of the neutrino mass operator because there was a symmetry controlling the appearance of, of, of essentially that matching contribution, how it appears in experimental results. So you can ask yourself, is there actually symmetry that's exact in the standard model that when you do these sort of loop corrections generating the hierarchy problem contributions to the Higgs mass? Uh, is first being perturbed or being broken by these corrections. So you can consider the mass of the standard model, or you can try to at least. And if you did that, what you could do is you could say, well, I'm going to say the bed is not there. Right? And then there's something called a formal symmetry around, you might think, with these sorts of rescalings in the scalar sector at least. But it's not that simple because remember, QCD exists, and QCD generates a scale at low values in the standard model. So the formal symmetry is not an exact symmetry of the standard model. The Higgs mass should at least be lambda QCD before these matching contributions. And that might comfort you or might not, but it's not an exact symmetry that's being broken. 
The skills are, however, less than the Higgs mass, so that's comforting to some people that these higher order corrections can shift into the higher values. Okay. So that being said, this is bidding back to this. I'm just about to finish. Oh, I'm over. I guess I'm going to go um, Remember this story where I was talking about all the scales, like these scales, like this lambda QCD scale and the beta are down here. And I was talking about the interesting scales, which were a loop factor about the Higgs mass. So I was saying they were interesting because of the matching calculation I was just showing you and how it's in the hierarchy problem shifting the values of the Higgs mass. So if we actually have those corrections around and they're just in this region, it's easier to think that those loop contributions with those heavy mass scales in the numerator could combine up to be basically around the mass that we see. But then you would expect to see those other states in the few TV region and hopefully some symmetry control in the cancellation. Okay. And what I was saying before about how with these properties we're looking for percent level deviations, I can now motivate to you why I was saying that before. So the percent level deviations in the properties of thermal Higgs lead to this TV scale sort of effects. So basically it's those formulas we were just looking at. Okay. So let's just do this and I'll be done. So these diagrams here for what I was talking about, maybe these sorts of shifts. So a simple argument you can do to yourself, this is not the most general UV case, but it's a simple argument you can just follow through, is saying, well, let's not tune things. Let's say the Higgs mass is big contributions like this, which breaks the lambda QCD value of the Higgs mass, which is there just in the standard model itself, and then these sorts of contributions from TV scale states generate the Higgs mass that we see. If that's the case, then you expect the Higgs mass to be roughly, oh, I got a square wrong, maybe it should be, this is not the square. This Higgs mass should go roughly with the coupling times the heavy mass scale. And then this, the, the number of degrees freedom and the four or five, this is a mistake I should do that. And you can just basically go through and say, if we're interfering a Wilson coefficient times the amplitude in the standard model, and then we're basically divided by the standard model squared, how do things scale? You have this Wilson coefficient, we basically have a heavy mass scale. We, we can turn this formula around, relate the heavy mass scale to the standard model Higgs, introducing lambda essentially. And we can basically take into account the four pi there in that formula. That's where the 16 pi squared comes. And if you basically then cancel off and just say that there's basic coupling dependent scaling in the standard model, you get this G standard model downstairs. So the Wilson coefficient can be slightly different, but this is the rough scaling that you expect. The V squares cancel because you go to the Higgs mass here, and then the other scale will be B squared from the Wilson coefficient. And then what remains is just this parametric scale for an amplitude times a higher dimensional operator where you're getting some effects that are not causing extreme tuning in the Higgs mass and divided by a standard multiplication. So you're having phase space being like this standard model because you're using like the V squared expansion that's in this map. This characteristic is what you get. And this is basically why this formula has the structure that it has. Now, if you look at this, as this 16 pi squared is basically the name of the game. These couplings are less than one. This numerical value from the number of degrees of freedom, which can be greater than one. This roughly works out to be sort of percent level deviations. So percent level deviations consistent with this argument would cause Higgs masses that were you know, consistent with what we see. And we would expect in the few TV region to hopefully find those resonances, but that's very hard to probe directly experimentally. So if we use the EFT techniques, we can hopefully first indirectly pick up the effects of that physics beyond the standard model period in this way. So it's just a consistency argument to see how big these effects can be. You can take these sorts of results, this sort of scaling, and plug it into the formulas I showed you before for the, for the W mass shift and for the Higgs width shift. And that's exactly why right now is a very interesting time experimentally in terms of the effects that we can see. So that's it. I'm just going to stop. Thanks very much. Uh, any questions from the audience or from the Zoom? No, I'll correct this and I'll give you an version of the slide. It should just be. Yeah, I need to correct that. So. Hmm. Yeah, so this is squared. Are there other questions? Thank you for the very talk. Uh, about the Higgs behavior. Um, mm -hmm. I just heard that still the Higgs triple calculation is not measured precisely. Yeah. 
You mean the ace to k width or it's in the security? In the ace to k width, yeah. It's good it's could be operating or it's not precisely better than it as a for Not at all. No. We neglect those effects because yeah. it's expected to be very small, right? Then you need some different information was included in the it's not here yeah. because in the standard model. So what you would have to do is you'd have to basically have those if you have a Higgs king, two other Higgs, right, from the Higgs being off shell, then you have to worry about those Higgs then decaying to fermions in final state, right. or some even higher multiplicity phase space where the Higgs goes through gate bosons. So the phase space compression combined with the Yukawa suppression is such that it's going to be so small, the standard model part, that people just neglect it, people just neglect it. So you could have a higher dimensional operator there, right. which makes it a little bigger compared to the standard model, but the standard model part of the amplitude will be so small itself. That it'll be something that's very subdominant to these effects. And in this expression, uh, do they only consider the narrowest approximation? No, that's what I was saying. This this is calculated without using the narrowest approximation for the perturbations. Mm -hmm. We just calculated the actual phase space integrals. Okay. So we did the whole calculation. Oh, the whole yeah. Oh, the whole yeah. That was the hard part. Because then you have to do these Monte Carlo numerical phase space integrations, which are really a nightmare. It took us a while to sort of. But that is built in here. We don't assume that. Yeah, yeah I, 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 assume, I like that the one shell is can decay into the shell three and then that can decay into the four fermion. It can, but then the final state, those things is, would have to go through light, because those final state fermions are light fermions. Right. And so you'd have to have essentially small U yeah, right. And you'll notice that I don't have the pendants here on, this is really the B part. BB. Yeah. So there's also, uh, you know, if you kind of start to look, you can see the B quark value here compared to the C quark value. You know, the value of the C quark. Yeah. But you can start to think about the dependencies of things which are, you know, like fermions, then you're going to have to take multiple hits of the B quark, Yukawa. Yeah. So if you're talking about the 4B decay, maybe. Then you might think about that. Maybe the 4B decay is big enough to think about actually. Maybe 4B decay. Maybe. It might be something to include actually to add. Uh, let's see. The off shellness of the Higgs itself this is an intrinsically off shell. Uh, so the phase space will be highly suppressed because it's, it's Higgs to Higgs with very off shell Higgs. So that will mean, I think. I think what will make it so it's so small is that you also get width factors of the Higgs, essentially, fundamentally, for the phase space population, which is so small compared to the standard model Higgs mass. There'll be an extra factor of 100 suppression. So I think that it's it's going to be too small to, to actually have an effect. It's the phase space, though, that'll make it too small to have an effect. Because you have the extra phase space suppression. I mean, just to be clear, if you're talking about this, Right, but these then both go to BB, right? Yeah, directed. Right, so just because this is like produced neuron shell, one of these has to be very off shell, right? Right. So it's going to be a propagator, which is going to be P squared minus M squared. And that P squared is going to be much, much less than the M squared. So you're going to have this extra M squared dependence around that's going to be suppressing this intermediate guy. And then and the scales need to be made up somehow. And they'll be made up by the width, I think. And then it'll be the very small extra suppression effect. Usually, when you're very off shell regions, it's the width that basically controls the phase space population. So that's really small because, you know, this is 4 MeV, whereas this is like 125 PV. So if you have two factors of that ratio, combining this Yukawa dependence, which you might not think intrinsically is that small. Then you're going to get hit by that for the standard model part of the amplitude. So it'll be the standard model amplitude will be very small, is what I'm saying. Now, if you have the higher dimensional operator effects, you can have it be something which is here shifting this guy and this guy and other effects. And you can say to yourself, well, this could be something that deviates significantly from higher dimensional operator. That's true. But the phase space suppression will still be there in both cases for the EFT effects and for the standard model effects. And I think if you actually work it out, you'll find that the net. Suppression due to the phase space suppression is going to be so small that it's not going to contribute significantly to the width. I'm sure. <laughs> you can check, but I'm sure.
Any uh, good questions? For uh, three level marketing, if you be companies, I uh, maybe contribution is not only the external level, but also the T and the new channel. I should include the T and the new channel contribution on the data fund board. Yeah, yeah, ah. yeah. So you always type the, the observable. Mm -hmm. So matching is 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 always observable to observable. Mm -hmm. So you take a matrix element mm -hmm. and another matrix element, mm -hmm. and essentially you, you tailor expand mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. The possible way to do physics. Yeah, she was right the way. So take an observable, calculate in this map with the Taylor expansion of some p squared over some heavy mass scale squared is less than one. And what that does, just thinking of this map itself, is it basically gives you the sort of predictions that we're calculating here. All the calculable stuff that you can get in terms of those formulas, when you do tree level or loop level or dimension eight operators, it's what gives you formulas like this for observables. And you just do this expansion because when you do this expansion, you end up with the Wilson code, you end up with the operators localized that we're multiplying this parameter dependence for each of the Wilson coefficients. And then if you take the same observable, essentially uh, in the UV model, so you take the standard model plus some other model, you can actually calculate whatever observable it is too, with like some intermediate propagators that are, you know. Some heavy mass scales around, not as heavy not case, <laughs> but some heavy mass scales around. You can you can you can this full diagram, tree level or one loop level, depending on the order. You have to make sure this order is the same as that order. But you calculate this thing, the full the full dependence of it, some offshore region can be integrated over, but it's just some actual matrix element. And then you do the expansion again, this one for here. And when you do the expansion for this guy. Then essentially, you basically will find that the parameter dependence from the UV model mm -hmm. then gets mapped onto the particular Wilson coefficients that are appearing in these sorts of formulas. And you can figure out how they appear step by step. Uh, you, you wrote the standard model plus? Say, say again. Uh, you, you wrote the standard model plus? Yeah, so you do this calculation mm -hmm. in like the full theory, which now is the standard model Lagrangian plus the other degrees of freedom, which are explicit long distance propagating states. And then you go to the kinematic region, which has p squared being less than those heavy mass mm -hmm. scales. And then this, sim this simplifies, according to the decoupling theorem, into what you could write down bottom up. And there'll be parts of this calculation which are IR physics, which will be exactly the same, and they'll cancel. And the things that are the differences between this calculation. And this calculation, mm -hmm. those differences, mm -hmm. you fix by saying this has to equal that. And that is what is called matching. That's what you do. The differences that can be there, you fix by saying the parameters here have to equal the parameters over there. The dependencies have to match. And you force that by hand. Mm -hmm. But the important part, you might say, well, that's vacuous then. Why are you doing this? But the important part is you just pick a couple processes mm -hmm. And you fix the matching, and then you know the Wilson coefficients, and you can do all sorts of other calculations like this for that Wilson coefficient dependence where you don't have to match for those other processes. Because you know the Wilson coefficient dependence on the model parameters, you can take the general EFT calculation and just stick in that parameter dependence for other observables. And it's much more efficient than for every possible observable doing this and then doing the Taylor expansion. You just have to do it a couple times to do the matching. Okay, let's uh, let's end it here. I think let's thank Michael again. Okay. I think maybe we'll come back at four thirty-five. Okay.